Um, welcome, gentlemen. Now, after listening to Hamish, I feel that I'm not qualified to uh, moderate this panel because I got, I got up this morning, like I always do, 10 minutes before the alarm. I don't know the alarm clock. I got into the shower. I turned it on myself. Um, I had a shower of about 11 or 12 minutes. I got out, got dressed, went up and ate the same cereal I did in about 1983. I walked to the train, got on the train and came to work. So for 30 odd years, I've been doing exactly the same thing. So I don't know whether I'm qualified. Um, but with that note, I, what I did do when I got on the train, I opened up, like we've all got, the iPhone and I started looking at things. So I looked at the weather, I looked at the market. So I'm not that far behind. So it's affecting all of us. So with that, let's kick off. The first thing we'd like to talk about is what, and what we're all thinking about is what is the next big trend um, that we're about to face? Hamish just touched on it. Um, I'll kick off with you, Daniel. What, what do you think, you, you invest in software, so it's very much tech-based investment at Airtree. What do you think is the next big trend that's going to shape the way we live our lives and the way business operates around the world? The, um the most transformative thing going on is the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, which is a combination of uh, neural algorithms or sort of learning algorithms um, built on neuroscience and contextual data sets. And that combination, and we'll call it machine learning or AI as a, as a sort of a naming convention, will dramatically change every job, every company, every industry, every society, and dramatically change. We're seeing the early stages of that, and we're talking about everything from health to education to retail to media. Um, if you are a company and you do not have access to sufficient data sets um, and then appropriate algorithms, you're screwed. And because your, your competitors will just run away from you, they have lower cost of customer acquisition, they have better data on what customers are doing with their products and want to do in the future, have lower cost of customer service. In health, you'll have quicker, um, quicker uh, diagnosis, better therapy allocation. So it's just in every area. And so you can't pick um, a particular uh, company. You'd have to say who are the likely winners going forward. Clearly, it's instructive to see that both that over the last year and a half, uh, Google and Microsoft, and to a certain extent Facebook, have started calling themselves artificial intelligence companies, not software companies. And that's not for, for any sort of PR. That's because they worked out their future is as a, as a platforms um, to, un to change business and society. Well, can I just stay with you for one sec? So when we talked last week, you talked about friends in Seattle. Seattle's yeah. the home of a lot of technology. Yeah. Um, and the way they live now. Do you want to give us yeah. some colour about... Yeah, I, I, it's, I, I think it's hilarious listening to, listening to Hamish because he's like a sort of a... I was going to say a reformed alcoholic, which I didn't mean that, but, but like he's, <laughs> he's discovered technology late in life and now he's a huge evangelist. And, yeah. you know, we've been saying this stuff for 10 years, Hamish, and you're sort of you're a late guy to the party, but, you know, good on you. Um, <laughs> um, and you're the most active he's guy. He's like, he's, like he's, the, he's the last virgin to the party going, wow, this thing's fantastic. Um, um, and, you know, I think that's great that he, he's, he gets it. But a lot of what he talked about is here today. I've, I've got a very good friend of, of, of mine who lives in Seattle and some who live in San Francisco who happened to use Google, the Alexa platform, the Echo product Alexa platform. And he today will say, Alexa, buy me shavers. And he's an Amazon Prime member. And today, Alexa knows that he's, what type of shavers he's ordered in the past, will order his shavers and they appear two, two hours later. Um, this other friend of mine uh, just moved from San Francisco to Seattle. Uh, he has not bought anything local since he's moved. He moved there three months ago. Everything he buys, even like from the local shops, he just doesn't bother going because through Amazon Prime and through Alexa, he can just get it wherever he wants. So a lot of this stuff's happening already. Um, I would say one thing, just interesting in your, 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 your um, travel choice of train, the super interesting thing that's going to happen is that the cost of an autonomous trip will become lower than the cost of public transport. That's the actual battle that's going to go on, the long-term battle. Short-term battle is easy to, to, yep. to, to understand. The longer-term battle is if, in fact, a trip for an individual is cheaper on a Uber platform or a Tesla platform, whatever, autonomous platform, then the government providing a train for you to get to work, what do the governments do? 
That's going to be the super interesting discussion. So that was a segue. But well, I'll have to take motion sickness tablets because I always get sick in a car okay. if I'm not okay. driving. But I'll, I'll go with that. So I think the future's already here in, in many ways. I mean, uh, you know, today there are algorithms that can better diagnose cardiac disease than cardiologists yep. today. It's going to affect us everywhere. So I'll come yep. back for an example Sorry. in a minute. But I'll Sorry. bring I'll bring Nick in. Uh, Nick, you invest here globally. Uh, you've done it for a long time. You're looking for trends. I'll put the same question to you. What's the big trend that's going to affect it, especially an investor as opposed to the general look, public? Look, personally, I think Daniel's just summed it up perfectly and, and to a certain extent stole my thunder, so I'll just oh, move on to the next bit. <laughs> and, and look, I agree with your sentiments entirely. I mean, we've been looking at this stuff for 10 years and, and I think I'm judging by the response, I think everyone's across the platform plays. You know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, you need to understand that the network effects around these companies mean that they can continue to grow and... And this makes them different from every other business on the planet. A digital business gets bigger as it gets bigger and, and, and doesn't run into size effects. And so Google had its results the other day. It just did its 27th quarter in a row of plus 20% revenue. So the law of large numbers doesn't affect it. And it's exactly what Daniel said. All these other things slowly come in. So if you're Amazon, for instance, you're a shopping platform. Then you're a shopping platform with artificial intelligence. Then you put voice on top. Then, as Hamish pointed out, you put your own products on top. And on and on it goes. So moving the conversation on, obviously digital's the future. I think Hamish summed it up, and I agree, <laughs> slightly late, but I'm glad you said it, not me. <laughs> um, I think Daniel's right that this is going to profoundly change your world. And look, from our point of view, we spend time trying to work out how to make money out of this. And to bring it down to just making money out of it, we know artificial intelligence is going to be big. I won't repeat that. Um, the reality is and it's an arms race. This is an arms race to see who gets there first. And so in most arms race I look at, it's either a fulfillment arms race, a data arms race, or a computing arms race. And in any arms race, you like to own the weapons manufacturers. So from our point of view, semiconductors is a great place to look at the moment. Uh, semiconductor companies are essentially the new resources to a certain extent. Uh, we remember the super cycle in resources. There will be a super cycle in semiconductors. And only because you have an industry that's essentially was one day just computers and then computers and smartphones, and now it's computers and smartphones and cars and factories mm. and hyperscale data centers, et cetera. And so to sum this up really quickly, some of you would have had some artificial intelligence interaction already. Mm. Your phone will tell you how long it's going to take you to get home. Your Facebook feed, feed tells you that you don't like Donald Trump and everyone else doesn't like Donald Trump. But somewhere in the world, someone's got a feed saying Donald Trump's a great guy. Uh, that's a Facebook feed essentially doing artificial intelligence. And it has to do that with speed and semiconductors. <laughs> So from our point of view, just extending the conversation, because I think Daniel summed it up so well, ultimately it's a war. There are other investments apart from the big platforms. We love the big platforms. Clearly semiconductors is one of them. And the other big one is data. Um, the guy who wins here is the guy who has the most data and has the most compute. And so from our point of view, we, as, as, as looking at big trends, are looking at companies that have data, that have well, data well, as a service. Can I come back in there? When we had a chat last week, yeah. you talked about video games, as I would know yeah, them, yeah. and how our children and everyone plays them now. And that's a great opportunity. It's changed a lot. It's become a communal-based uh, game. And now people are actually getting played, uh, paid not to go out in the field and run around and run fast to jump higher, but they're, they're doing it with their thumbs in a room and getting paid to join these teams. So give us a little bit of colour on that and what, yeah, why okay. that's so, a good so opportunity. Yeah, so video games is a basically your best chance of finding the next Facebook, quite frankly. It's your best chance of finding the next big platform. And put it really simply, we looked at this in 2014. Video games used to be a console. I think we all grew up playing a Commodore 64 or Mario, and you play the game and you clock it and you throw it away. Uh, now, because of where the internet's changed, you can take that game and you can turn it into an ecosystem and we can all play it together. And so just to extend this on, Electronic Arts is a great company in the US. It's actually run by an Australian. No one knows who he is. He's 42 years old from Geelong. And uh, he's essentially, if you look at Electronic Arts, it used to be 35 games a year. It's now eight. Mm. And it's making four times as much money. Mm. And these games are ecosystems that you can sit in and you can enjoy and we can communicate. We can play against each other in other countries. This is no different to a Facebook. Mm. This is no different to a YouTube, if that makes sense. And what's, I think, really scary about it now, or the free option to the upside, is these games are now turning into sports. Uh, so Activision just launched the Overwatch League. There's seven teams in seven different countries. They sold them for $20 million each. Uh, and what is going to happen one day, people are playing this game, Overwatch, in their bedroom. They're playing it. And one day, they're going to come out of their bedroom and say, hey, mum, I'm off. I've just been recruited to the Shanghai team of Overwatch, and they're paying me $400,000 a year. And I could potentially earn millions. And these guys actually own a sport. 
and think about what that could be worth. And I think the last thing that we find really interesting is if you look at the NFL figures in the US, they are falling. Mm. They are down 10% year on year. The Premier League figures are falling. They're down nearly 10% year on year. Things are changing, yeah. Things are changing very rapidly. And I'm not sure whether $400,000 is better than other things you can do in your bedroom, but we'll go with it for the moment. Um, bring Paul, Paul in. Yeah, Paul, you've got a different job. You've got a lot of money to run uh, in a big fund in Australia, but you're also looking for uh, themes and trends, and Australia hasn't got a lot to invest in. Uh, it's a pretty barren landscape. We went through this in the late 90s. America had all the technology. We were a, an old, outdated economy. And then the resources boom came and we were the in thing. But we seem to be back probably about 1997, 98 now and we're, we're, we're not really there. But are there opportunities and what trends do you see uh, for the more generalist investor who's looking at the share market? Yeah, well, you won't be surprised to know that I, I do think there is uh, lots of opportunities <laughs> in Australia. Um, I guess one of the things I find anyway uh, is, you know, with a, with a big firm, you get sort of access to what's happening um, in Silicon Valley or whatever from, from through, our, through Fidelity's investments. But you, I, in Australia, you get, I get to apply it to sort of a manageable universe. So I guess the beauty of Australia is I you know, can pretty much meet with the entire market every year and sort of you know, get on top of it. I do think there are, there's a, you know, there is some new, the IPOs that are coming into the market presenting some new opportunities. So uh, one we can maybe talk about later if you want to, like WiseTech was a, uh, a big investment for us. So software and e-commerce is obviously a very attractive space. Um, we had the opportunity to invest about a year before the IPO also, which was, which was quite attractive. Technology, we, I mean, de technology is definitely a smaller part of the Australian market. Uh, but it's, you know, the interesting thing is I'm probably still spending, you know, based on what everyone said, I'm still spending more and more time un trying to understand the technology landscape because even though we don't necessarily have the technology companies, albeit we're getting a little bit more with the wise sticks, um, I think the application is right across all sectors. So, um, you know, in artificial intelligence, I would agree with everybody that that is, that is by far going to have the biggest impact not, and, you, and it's not just about trying to find companies that are going to deliver the best artificial intelligence, but it's, it's what's that going to do to consumer companies? What's that, what, what is that going to do to companies? Which company is going to be the winner from it? I think one of the things we talked about previously was also one of the areas that we're particularly interested in that comes out of that is a sort of digital delivery of food. Yep. So, and I think that's just a fascinating space. And if you look at growth rates around the world, this is going to be one of the fastest growing areas. So in the US, the expectation is the digital delivery of food is going to grow seven times in the next decade. In Australia, it's meant to double in the next three years. So, and I was actually um, uh, just up in our Shanghai office last month talking to one of the younger sort of millennial analysts and she's saying now in China, you know, they've got an app. If you want to, if she wakes up on a Saturday morning, she wants a coffee delivered to a home. She hits the app and they bring the coffee straight to a home. She, you know, same for breakfast. So it's just that people are cooking less and less at home or they're cooking for special occasions. Uh, they're eating more and more out. But I think the next phase is actually wanting the food to come to your home. And that's, that is, a, like I said, based on the US or, or Australia, that's the huge growth area. And what, what we've seen... You know, companies like um, Menulog and uh, Deliveroo and Uber Eats establish trying to uh, capture that market because mm -hmm. it's going to be a huge market and they're all sort of scrambling to try to... Um, we'll talk about capture. the older players been around established footprint retail, something like a Domino's, which we talked about. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess that's what we would look at. So, from an Australian perspective, we actually think Domino... So, at the moment, anyway, we think that the, the Uber Eats of the world have a flawed business model. And that what they're trying to do is put, you know, a local fish and chip shop together with one of their Uber drivers. And, the, you know, the fish and chip shop have to just cook it just at a perfect timing that someone sitting under a tree somewhere is going to go pick it up and deliver it. But, I don't know, my experience at the moment, anyway, is that it's, you know, 30 minutes is sort of best case, but it's more like an hour before it gets to your home and it's not hot. <laughs> Um, and you, you know, you, you've gone beyond hungry by the time it actually arrives. <clears throat> Domino's is really focused on, and, and people have followed that same line, are really focused on delivery. It's all about delivery. So Domino's uh, catchphrase is sort of three, three and ten, which is cook it in three minutes, deliver it in ten. So from when you order it online to when it gets delivered to your home, their target, they're not there at sort of 20 minutes, 15 minutes now, but their target is to do it in ten. So if you've got a pizza coming to your home in 10 minutes, that's a 
hugely positive consumer experience uh, that's just going to drive more and more growth. It's going to come hot, and it's going to come when you want when you want to eat it. Um, and that's going to make, to me that makes a huge difference. And obviously, Domino's are looking at well, how do they? Exp- mm-hmm. You know, are they a pizza company or are they a delivery company? And the more that they focus on that sort of digital delivery of food, the more the opportunities, I think, open up for them and they've gone down the track of also um, sort of anywhere delivery. So if you're sitting in, in a park or at the beach or whatever, the, the Uber technology of where you drop the pin, the actual delivery will come to you. To, where, yep. you know, if you're sitting in the, on the beach and you want a pizza on the beach, the delivery guy will come. You could be eating deliver. six or seven times a day. Yeah. Um, Going back to Daniel, we've been very evangelical, we've been in the church, let's get to the other side. Industries that are going to be under threat as the technology and the way we behave changes. Have you got some ideas around which industries you would try and avoid? Sure. Um, just on the food one, I think if you, if you look at early markets of where food delivery is going, I think if you look in San Francisco now, some of the, the new growth companies are actually, and they've targeted around 15 minutes being the maximum time for delivery. So they're cycling around, not cycling, they're in cars, around suburbs with pre-prepared meals, high quality meals in the trucks. You know, ch- choice of seven meals, so they can guarantee delivery of a high quality meal, not so much a necessary pizza, but a high quality meal um, within 15 minutes. And the only way you can do that is by having the food in situ ready to go. And so there, there, there are amazing companies doing that now in San Francisco. So it, it changes the way we think about food delivery from your local Indian or no, it's going to be sort of manufactured vertically integrated. Anyway, um, I think you'd have to say that um, retail is still going to get smacked terribly. Um, you, you, a, uh, Mary Meeker's deck, those of you who, who get the Kleiner Perkins deck every twice a year from Mary Meeker, it's fantastic. Her recent deck has some amazing stats there about retail closures <laughs> in the US. There's no reason to think it'll be any different in Australia. In fact, I would argue probably worse, um, both in just, just closure of retail stores, but the flow on impact to, um, to the uh, property plays in retail. I mean, there's, you know, you see the shift in some of the um, large property plays in, in malls and, you know, retailers are, are, are failing, so they're st- sticking them full of fast food companies. Well, there's just so many fast food companies that can sit in a mall before that also becomes oversaturated. So I think, I think retail and the flow on to retail will just get smacked around something because it's a particularly bad experience. Retail is still a sh- pretty shitty experience. And the online versions of Australian retail are terrible. I think to take, pick up uh, what, one of um, Nick's points, which I think some people, n- n- Nick obviously gets, but some to understand is that the, a- the Amazon logistics play, forget everything else, it is the best logistics play in the world. So if you're a supplier of a product, you're kind of economically forced to use Amazon because the best CRM, the best logistics and lowest cost, et cetera. So there's this really interesting sort of play that goes on that if you're a logistics, to, if you're a logistics guy, you should be really scared of Amazon. Even nothing to do with retail because they do logistics better than everybody else does it. So only the logistics guys, I think, get come into play. Okay. Probably a good chance to bring you back in, Paul. Uh, we, we talked about that as well with Amazon coming onshore rather than, than taking pot shots offshore. They're coming onshore, whether it's next year, year after, but they've told us they're coming. Uh, in the listed market, uh, is, that, is that still, we've seen a lot of stocks sold off because everyone knows they're coming now. Is there more to come? I mean, Daniel's very bearish. Uh, you've got to face the, the light of, you know, a listed market. What do you think? Uh, look, well, I definitely think it's, it's going to be a challenge. And I guess one of the things we typically try to do uh, when we look at the potential impact in Australia, we look at what's happened in other markets. UK is probably a good example of what can happen when Amazon enters the market. And that was quite negative for the retailers. Uh, and, you know, our experience in the UK was... Uh, it's not just about Amazon winning share. They, Amazon doesn't even have to win share, but because uh, it's it's all about it's all about transparency and price discovery and and the retailers that were maybe, and we do have unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, we've got a reasonable number of retailers in Australia that maybe are earning abnormal profits, um, and they get they get very, they get they're the ones that get squeezed very hard when you get an Amazon. So even if Amazon doesn't win that business, they have to bring their margins down. Tr- and you have to look at the retail, and you know when you're looking at your retailers, you really have to say, are they, you know, are they? There's been a sort of, you know, what they need to do is sort of reprice, get the margins down, and look to the future rather than trying to, I don't know, maintain their incumbency yep. uh, and uh, sort of live off this un- incumbency because it's going to disappear very, very quickly when Amazon comes. I would only, I would put one. 
caveat around it in that you don't, as an investor, I think you need to, you know, look at it and assess it, and that's, at the moment, the assessment is quite bearish, but you, I don't think you can just do it and then and, and go away from it as well. So one of the other experiences, I was, I was a, uh, back in the late 90s, I was a banks analyst based in our London office, and at the time uh, that the internet was really starting to take off, and you had a lot of technology firms, um, you know, expanding a whole range of businesses, basically the banks were going to end. So at that point, the banks got very, very cheap because that was going to be the end of a bank. Who needed a bank when you had the internet and you had uh, borrowers and lenders that could just interact with each other? But what's actually happened from that, that the, the whole process has been the biggest benefit. The banks have probably been the biggest beneficiary from all of this. So that what it did is actually took their costs down very, very significantly. They didn't have to reinvest in branches and actually it lowered their cost structure. And they have been probably the biggest beneficiary mm. from that, so from that move. So can take advantage so of So just, be, I guess as just a warning, just, you know, like, so it looks very bearish, but, you know, like, you, you do need to stay on top of it because sometimes the first derivative is easy to see. It's actually the second and third derivative that's quite difficult to see. And you still need to be following it closely because it can take a turn very rapidly. Yep. I mean, okay. Walmart's done a very good job since the buying of Jet to recover. So they're now, they went down, they were like sort of 3% of sales online. They're now at 16 to 70% of sales online, which is sort of world's best practice for a traditional retailer up with the Nordstrom. So they've actually done a very good job as an incumbent. Nobody in Australia is anywhere near that no, level of sophistication. And you know, Walmart yeah. has 6,000 data scientists sitting in California <laughs> doing pricing algorithms and, yeah. and, and things. Just, just, I think the, the, uh, the other threat on that is second, first and second order of derivatives. You look at what Amazon's done with batteries and, and, and um, baby nappies in terms of product swap. And, and they're now one of the biggest suppliers of their own battery, of batteries that are their own in the, in the world. So there's, a, there's these flow on effects of yep. product categories where people don't really care about who the battery is, you know. No, that's right, no branding. Uh, bring you back in, Nick. I, a family of five at home, I'm regularly the only person watching television. Uh, <laughs> it's a lonely experience being a dad. Um, <laughs> free to wear television. Run. Uh, maybe that's another industry that, you, that we might yeah, be worried about. Yeah, look, about. obviously, we discussed this earlier. Um, yeah, I think, um, look, we've, we've discussed this before. I mean, ultimately, free-to-air television, unfortunately, goes where the, where the, where the newspaper goes. Uh, it's just behind, to a certain extent. Um, come back to the mobile device. When you look at a mobile device, you're on a train. I don't think anyone's looking at a newspaper anymore. They're looking at a mobile device. On that mobile device, there's essentially two players, which is Google and Facebook, and there's a staggering statistic, but Google and Facebook basically take 80% of all incremental advertising dollars in the world today. So every other person on the planet is going for that last 20%, if that makes sense, of incremental advertising dollars. And if, again, if you back it out, you could actually work out that every single media company in Australia is shrinking, and Amazon and Google is taking share. Which when, which when you extend it, I always find it really surprising that Australian investors then don't take this on board and then go and invest in Amazon, and Google and Facebook. Uh, but that's another topic. Ultimately, TV's next. Uh, advertisers follow eyeballs. They don't really care. Uh, the eyeball is on the mobile telephone. It's not on television. On top of that, you have over-the-top services like Netflix. Mm -hmm. And then again, guess what? That company again, Amazon, also has an over-the-top service to attract you to the Prime platform, mm -hmm. which... I completely agree with Daniel. Again, it's this amazing platform that I have lived in that essentially delivers everything you want. And I think, just to, as a quick segue into Amazon, I think you, people in Australia really need to get their head around this. I've lived in the UK for two years. I backed it out. I worked out I spent 40% of my disposable income mm. on Amazon. Mm. 30 items a week came to my house. The guy came to my house every single day. Mm. Toothpaste, <laughs> deodorant, everything. Mm. And so people really need to get their head around this in Australia. And even if you speak to the retailers like Best Buy and others, exactly to your point, Paul, couldn't agree more. I saw Best Buy three weeks ago. Margins have to go to five, maybe lower. Mm. Store count has to shrink by 3% every year. They get it. That's what they have to do. And they're, they're going to survive. Coming back to TV, same problem. It's the same network effect. If everybody is watching Game of Thrones, or everyone's watching House of Cards on Netflix, for instance, then inevitably more people are going to look at Netflix, which means more money goes to Netflix, which means yes. more talent goes to Netflix, which yes. means more people watch Netflix. And so there is literally no way commercial television can compete. It's an arms race, and they're going to lose. And ultimately, they turn into a provincial newspaper to a certain extent with news about AFL footballers and rugby league players, and that's essentially it. Um, and so from that point of view, this is not anything new. This is digitalization. Mm -hmm. It happens in every industry that goes digital. Every single one is the same. It essentially all goes to the one place over time, and the network effects make the winner stronger, 
and everybody else weaker. And unfortunately, it will happen to television as well. Um, and and we, would, we would play it from the short side on a regular basis. And if you look at, 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 at I think the thing, I agree with Nick completely, if you look at the flow of, of um, original content, which is actually the driver of, of the Netflixes and those guys, uh, first two things, you, you see the, uh, age, the average age of free-to-air television viewers like 55 and, you know, so, you know, if you're selling adult nappies, it's really good, the rest of it, not, not so much. Um, but the, but the, the other thing is the amount of money being invested in original content. And Netflix, we all know the, Crowns, the, the Crown or we know House of Cards. So you only need a couple of those. They released 29 dramas last year in the US. Yeah. A couple of those and you're happy with your 10 bucks a month. Correct. Well, again, I'm not going to harp on Amazon, but it's important to understand them. You say Amazon this year will spend five times what HBO is spending on original content. So they are a logistics company that's spending five times what an entertainment company is. Why? to make Amazon Prime successful as its own thing, but also be a customer acquisition engine into the whole business. Mm -hmm. So how do, as a free-to-air television, compete with that? They can't. You might get one or two series that end up on Stan or something, but the great mass, everyone will have a Netflix account, everyone will have an Amazon Prime account, and then you might do something else. So let's, let's get on to the next question uh, that might be of interest in the world, where they might rename Earth Amazon. And... Um, yeah. and and in a, you know, in a world of artificial intelligence, the, the irony is that we've got rock stars as businessmen. Um, CEOs, who's, who do you think is the leader, who we've got to follow, who's going to set the agenda, and who has been in the past? Nick, I'll stick, kick off with you. Yeah, I mean, look, just in answer to your question, look, I don't disagree with anything you say. Just the big thing to watch out for these companies, just to be clear, is regulation. Eventually, someone's going to say this isn't fair. Yeah. quite frankly, like a populist backlash against Amazon or a populist yeah. backlash against Google. You see it in this country already. That's the key thing you have to watch. These companies are very aware of this, by the way. Uh, and when you meet them, and we do, they, I, I promise you, they are physically trying not to make too much money uh, because they know what they're trying to do. Um, I, think, I think the important thing to understand here, and unfortunately it hasn't happened in Australia, um, is you have to lose a lot of money to be number one in a digital space for a long period of time, and Australian investors were not prepared to do that. Uh, so I think Jeff Bezos, number one by far, um, the pieces are already in place. And I'm not even going to touch Australia because I, I know it's hypersensitive and we could argue about this all day. The reality is even in the US where they've been for 20 years, they have already won. They, it is very difficult for them to lose from here because of these logistics centres that Daniel mentioned. There's 174 of them around the world. They cost a billion dollars each. They take up 14 football fields. And by the way, that's why they're not coming to Australia that quickly, by mm. the way, because you'd know if they'd taken up 14 football fields around the corner. It it's going to take at least three years to come here. But by having that in place in America already, that network effect has started. They're already number one. It's going to feed on itself, and it can't stop. And we didn't even talk about cloud computing. And I just thought it was really interesting this year that even Warren Buffett at his thing spent most of his, <laughs> most of his uh, annual cinema talking about Amazon because he's just amazed that mm -hmm. this has worked. Uh, and I think well, if, he'd, if he'd studied the digital businesses of the world, the ones that came before them, and there's a reason why they all come from California, because they all talk to each other. They play yeah. golf with each other. They play coffee with each other. They, they realise the same concept. The same concepts are working over and over again. And so I don't think it's surprising. And the pieces are already in place, and Bezos worked it out well before well we before did everyone. and well before everyone else did. And just just to take your thread, if I could, I think it's a really interesting one there about Australia. You say, look, look at cloud computing. So Amazon's AWS business is a $12 billion revenue business last year growing, so that and Azure and Google are probably going to win the yep. globally, and yet you've got, you know, um, telcos in Australia, I won't name them, who think they're going to build scaled um, cloud computing, computing and storage platforms. They might in the short term, long term, they can't. I mean, th today, Microsoft, I know the guys at Microsoft are doing it, Microsoft, Google and, and Amazon have got computer designers designing computers working with Intel to optimise a computer to, to work in that space, and our telcos are buying Dells off the Dells off the rack online. You know, I mean, it's just not the same. No, they're way they, ahead of us. They now, can't they can't meet the curve. We're on probably, cost we've got probably two Sorry. minutes to go before we Sorry. try it open to the audience and, and make sure you do your questions so we can answer. We'll have about ten minutes of that. Uh, besides the Jeff, Jeff Bezos fan club, which I know you're a member of, Daniel, is there so, someone else you're watching? And, and probably just 30 seconds on someone Elon else. Elon Musk. You, you, you can't go... He's the only guy... Well, Jeff Bezos has done it internally, but the only guy to have been a, either a co-founder or a founder of three multi-billion dollar companies. He's changing the world. People, I think, don't 
generally understand that Tesla is not a car company. <laughs> it actually has got way better autonomous software and data than anyone else by a country mile. And it's basically going to be an energy company. So I think he is extraordinary. Okay. I'll put him there. Paul, I know you're not playing too much golf in San Francisco, uh, so you've probably got a bit of an independent <laughs> view. Someone, yeah, I mean, I guess someone you look up to, look at and think, well, geez, they're kicking goals. Yeah, I guess from an Australian, if I focus on Australia, I, I guess a couple of things I'd just note is, you know, when I was in London, I used to manage our uh, global financial services fund. And I think Austra Australian corporates, Australian executives do um, stack up very well against, uh, on the, it's definitely on the financial side, the corporate governance in Australia is, is very high relative to the world. The focus on sh shareholder returns is, is, is also very, very high. So I think Australian uh, executives and corporates approach it in the right, you know, they're, they're starting from a good, um, a, a good point. At, in, at an individual level, um, look, I would probably come back. I, I'm always impressed with people, you know, the same sort of things. They're, they're pushing the envelope all the time. So, I mean, I've obviously talked about our, uh, the stake in Domino's. I think uh, Don May, who's the chief executive of Domino's, he continually push the, pushes the envelope. So, um, you know, one of the areas he gets sort of, um, uh, not, not criticised, but, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, they're, they're wanting to try to look at the... Uh, uh, drone delivery of pizzas, and uh, he continually comes under criticism for talking about that. You know, and they're actually working with Flirty, who are the ones that are working with Amazon in terms of the uh, drone drone delivery. But he's not; they're not really focused on, you know, that's going to be a huge success in the short term. It's actually that if that works, if some, you know, it's all about delivery. It's all about getting that food to people very quickly. If, it's, if that's going to take, if that is actually going to take off, they can't afford to not be in it. They've got it. They actually have to be part of it. And to me, that is the executive saying, "I need to be at the cutting edge all the time, mm. um, and making sure that we're sort of, um, you know, we're going to get, we're gonna get the, uh, whatever they deliver uh, to people within ten minutes." And uh, you know, with, at all different levels, they've pushed the envelope in terms of. Uh, uh, their app, in terms of the online delivery, in terms of moving to mobile, in terms of uh, de uh, delivering anywhere. Um, so, like, I, that's the sort of thing you look for from your chief executive that's, that's pushing the envelope continually. And obviously, uh, Richard White at WiseTech, I think, is doing a good job as well. Yep. Okay. So, uh, hopefully, we, we'll get the questions up on the backboard here. Um, are we ready for questions? There we go. So, the first one would be interested to hear the panel's view on energy. We are using more and more for tech, which businesses are driving tech with efficiency around solar. So I'm not sure who to direct that to. Who, who's, who's looked at energy? Nick, do you want to have a shot? Look, I, I spent, I spent uh, five years as an oil and gas analyst out of Edinburgh. I worked for Wood McKenzie, which is a big oil and gas consultancy, and never in my wildest dreams would have I thought I'd see the oil market disintermediated, but it is essentially being disintermediated. Uh, shale technology, we meet these companies every week. Every American company says the same thing. They said, they, if the Saudis think they're going to drive us out of the market, they're wrong, we can lower the price. We can go lower with shale, we can get more out, we can go lower. So I think the average cost of shale is $30 to $40 at the moment, and it can go lower, because uh, they have the technology to do it, and, and, and this is, they, they've completely debunked peak oil. I mean, no one said that for a while, right? So that's long gone. So you're getting disintermediated on the supply side, and you're also getting disintermediated on demand side because the oil price has fallen so far, yet people still want to buy electric cars. And so the electric technology is superior. It just is. Unfortunately, Tesla's the only one with the guts to go out there full-blown, and they've got the whole market to themselves. And so I agree it's a great investment if you can get your head around the valuation. But um, what about solar and wind and... Look, I'll, will, so ultimately, will oil and coal be so, around in 20 So just moving on, look, I'll, I'll just talk about solar. I mean, ultimately, because of Moore's law and the price of the cost of semiconductors, ultimately solar will go below mm. the cost of oil and go below the cost of gas because it, it can get there. It already is in some developing countries. So you'll see a lot more solar. You'll see a lot more battery technology, things like the power wall, et cetera, that Tesla's doing. And so you're getting disintermediated on the demand and the supply side. And I think from an investment perspective, it's really interesting because it's, it's nearly 10% of the global indices is energy. And all that money's got to find a home somewhere else. And we spend our life trying to find other homes to put it in. And unless you want to buy small lithium stocks in Australia, or Tesla, yeah. or some uh, European, European technology companies, it's really hard to find, quite frankly. OK. All right. Now, could we have the next question, if there's another one? Uh, could Baidu and the other Asian tech giants challenge their North American counterparts in the, in the future? And if so, could they take much market share? Daniel, you might have a view on that. So, I mean, the, 
The beauty about Baidu's and the WeChat's and the Tencent's is that um, in the Chinese market, they had this sort of vertical integration. So in, in, the, in the Australia or the US, you know, you have your, um, your Twitters as your sort of chat platforms and you have your Facebooks and you have your Googles. Well, you have these vertical things. So if in WeChat, you can do a text and then you can see what's going on and you can do social chat and you can buy stuff. So the data they capture is extraordinary in terms of that vertical integration to the behavior of the customer. That doesn't actually help that much if you're going internationally. So I don't think, do I think that Baidu and Tencent and those guys will be big in the US? No, I don't. Could they be big in some smaller Asian countries? Absolutely, they could. Where I do think they've got an advantage will be in data capture AI as it applies to health. Because lung cancer is lung cancer whether you, whatever country you're in. And the ability to vertically integrate um, stacks of data and then algorithms, and, and China, China had a Sputnik moment with AlphaGo, and China is now investing enormous amounts of money in, in artificial intelligence. So I do think the health equivalent could become global quite quickly from China. Okay, next question. I'm sure there's more. If AI tech are dominant opportunities in the next few decades, what does this mean for portfolio diversification? Well, Paul, that's, that's made for you. It is. Can you give uh, us a view on that? Yeah, I guess it was sort of, I think that to me is exactly along the lines I was, I was getting at is that uh, AI and tech, there's obviously companies that develop that AI and tech, but it has huge ramifications for a whole range of different sectors. And in every sector, there'll be winners and losers. So it's not as though you shouldn't, you know, so there's, there'll still be consumer stocks that do incredibly well. Uh, there'll be some that'll do very badly, but there'll still be some that do incredibly well. There'll still be, you know, financial service stocks that do incredibly well. So that is, the diversification is still there, but uh, AI and tech is going to impact sectors significantly, and it's, it's about making sure you've got the management team that's, uh, that understands it, We've seen that, you know, even in the retail sector in Australia. Obviously, you know, very high-profile people have said that the whole internet, you know, is completely bogus and, and don't want to go down that path. And that they've paid the price for that. Uh, so we'll see that across all sectors. So it, should, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't still invest in, you know, mining or, or financial services. Yeah, yeah, I'll just go jump ahead. in there. I mean, look, we're a growth fund and obviously we get a bent towards technology, but it doesn't mean it's there. And I, I mean, one thing we found, which I think is fascinating in times of your sets, and Australia's the point, is, is we've actually invested quite heavily in caravan companies and recreational vehicles. And, and the average age of your caravan purchaser in the US in just five years has dropped from 55 to 45. There is a huge secular shift mm. towards caravans because nature is nature. And, and as much as Hamish might enjoy wearing his augmented reality goggles, it's, it's, it's not the same as going up to seal rocks and staying in a caravan park, and you will have the time to do it because you don't spend the weekend at the shops. And so this is already happening in the world. There are already winners based on the back of technology that have nothing to do with it. Uh, and, and remember that the digital world is really, at best, going to be 40% of what we do. There's still a physical world. There's still restaurants. There's still food. There's still camping. OK, we've got time for one more quick question, uh, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Nobody on stage today except Hamish has mentioned Apple. Biggest company in the world. Could panel comment? You've all got 15 seconds. Nick? Look, really simply, if you're looking for growth, which is what we are, the biggest company in the world is unlikely to get you the next leg of growth, if that makes sense. Apple is a perfectly good investment. It was one of our best performing investments of all time, number three. Um, but we, we think today there are better opportunities elsewhere. And ultimately, most of it is hardware. Only a big chunk of it, only a chunk of it is iOS and hardware is, is not, doesn't have the same characteristics as what we're talking about. Paul, they changed the world in 2007. Hamish told us that. What's wrong with Apple? <laughs> not, well, I don't know. I've, got, I've got lots of Apple products. I mean, I'm a happy user of a lot of the products. But I mean, I would agree with what was said before that content, data and content, those companies that have the data and content, they're going to be the, they're going to be the winners. Apple has some of it, but because of a lot of the security issues that they do have around it, they don't use it as well as they should do, whereas someone like Google is a much better user of that, um, of, uh, of that, of the content, or we talked about Baidu, you know, much better users of that, of that content. But you've got to gather that content first. They're the ones that, are in a world of artificial intelligence, they're the ones that are going to get well ahead of their competitors. So, look, I mean, I, you know, Apple's got the capability, but it probably needs to cha change some of those sort change of um, security again. issues, I guess. Yep. Daniel, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was just going to say, I, I did what Paul just said. We had Apple 
devices everywhere. I changed to Samsung on my phone. Ah. Two years later, I'm back. Yeah. So well, what's so, wrong yeah, with Apple? Yeah. Well, because it's an ecosystem battle. Um, so the two counterintuitive things going on. There's the ecosystem battle, which is to leave the ecosystem and come back again is quite painful. So you, your pain barrier, the, the fact that the Samsung 8 is actually better than the iPhone 7 and probably the iPhone 8, you probably won't go to the Samsung because you're leaving the ecosystem and all your photos and everything. So there's a massive cost to leave the ecosystem. And that's good for Apple. The bad for Apple is that most revenue comes out of hardware, not out of software. So you, whereas they are getting good adoption rates through software and the ecosystem and people are staying there, they need to sell a shitload more phones every year, and that's just really hard in a world where Samsung's doing such a good job in the general world. So, it's a, it, it, so that's why they're trading at a lower PE, and probably appropriately so. Yeah, they've got to sell 220 million phones a year yeah. to break even. But, that, and they are doing good things in so, software. So, sorry, to, to get the same earnings. I mean, their photos, photos, photos app is good. I think Google, I'm, a, I'm an iOS user, but Google, Google's a better photos app, has gone from being the worst to being yeah. the best. Um, Apple, Apple's a bit lazy there, so, but their software store is good, it's just that so much of the revenue comes out of hardware, the, mm, at, at hard, high margin too. They're incredibly yeah. high margin on their hardware. Okay, well that, that will wrap us up. I'd like everyone to thank Daniel Petrie, Paul Taylor and Nick Griffin for being with us and sharing our thoughts. Thanks very much, gentlemen.